I don't get it. Where is space to put the food in? This is a WaveTech 1910 giant XY oscilloscope monitor. 12 inches worth of it. And uh, I got this thing for free from a pile of disused gear at the site. And uh, I figured I'd try to get it home and uh, get some utility out of it, which uh, has led me to realise that this, very sadly, is a device which has a rather bad coolness to utility ratio, as uh, witnessed by this very bad rendition of the Uscape demo. And uh, there are two reasons for this uh, abhorrent performance, and first and foremost it's got to do with the absolutely lacking bandwidth of this thing. It's got a vertical bandwidth of supposedly 15 kilohertz, and it starts to roll off before that. And it's got a horizontal bandwidth of uh, one and a half kilohertz, and uh, it turns way non-linear prior to getting anywhere near that. It's practically useless at uh, scanning speeds above about 200 hertz or so, which really limits its uh, potential for. Uh, any practical use really, which is a real shame because as you can see this is, a, uh, this is a very nice unit, it's in very good nick and it's got a long persistence phosphor, so if I turn the intensity down like that it takes ages for it to fade. So it's got a fantastic look to it, but uh, the second issue which makes it almost unusable is the fact that it for whatever reason, the horizontal and the vertical are not perfectly in phase. If you try to graph something x, y, you, you end up with all kinds of weirdness going on. Unless you, you are using extremely low frequency, like tens of hertz, then it's kind of okay-ish. But uh, anything beyond that, it just turns horribly out of phase and doesn't really give you any worthwhile results whatsoever. But I think it would at least to do a little teardown of this thing and to see what makes it tick. I have actually cheated and taken it apart to clean it out a bit because the controls were all scratchy and horrible. But they did clean up nice. Which makes it even more of a shame to say that this unit is so useless because it's it's in fantastic shape. It, I know that it, has, it hasn't been used for about a decade and prior to that it wasn't much used at all and everything feels perfect, it behaves perfect, uh, aside from the uh, face issue, which uh, I haven't, I've got the manual for it, I haven't been able to figure out a way uh, which would uh, test uh, whether or not that's within spec or not. And the cover comes off really easily, just three screws either side. And we're in! The Model 1910's most outstanding feature is its mechanical strength and electrical reliability. In the event of servicing is required in the field, maintenance personnel will find that the unit's single PC board construction, organised component layout, plus a comprehensive instruction manual, all contribute in making this instrument easy to service, even for the relatively inexperienced technician. I do have to hand it to them, but they seem to be quite true to their word, because there isn't much going on in this thing at all. On the left side we've just got a really anonymous looking high voltage can and two giant caps and two <laughs> single little acuity transistors hooking up to some heat sinks just to free the aluminium case. And on the right side we've just got the main board with all the driver stuff and the vertical preamps and a giant transformer and that's about it. So any modifications made by the previous owner should be pretty easy to find out. And on the back side we've just got a few extra inputs going on, namely a vertical marker thing, which seems to be basically an extra horizontal channel in practice, and an intensity modulation input and a switch to turn off the auto blanking thing which is uh, which turns off the beam when you have a new signal input in order to prevent burning a dot into your screen. Now, I think that uh, these are probably intended to work together in order to basically allow you to draw static markers on the screen because if you run these uh, in phase uh, you, you can basically move the dot to a specific place in the waveform 
and then put the pulse in on the intensity modulation input and basically just create a dot at the same place in the waveform every time. You can also use the intensity modulating input to just blank the screen if you're using it like an oscilloscope screen. So these are a pretty nice set of extra features which could definitely come in handy in many applications but uh, you need a pretty high-tech sweep generator in order to actually make any use of them. And if we have a look at the actual main board it becomes really apparent that this really is a pretty run-of-the-mill and designed to be simple and serviceable and reliable unit. This big board is basically just a two-channel am power amplifier and we've got some really run-of-the-mill 4558 op going there, some pretty standard, I think they're American transistors, a whole heap of passives and diodes, we've got a diode voltage double going on down here, big power supply, lots of point-to-point -point wiring, Big caps going on up there. These are actually in surprisingly good shape. I've measured them. And a giant potentiometer for the focus adjustment. This might have a reasonably high voltage across it, which might be why they've decided to make it so large. And the vertical preamplifier boards just have another little op amp going on in there somewhere. And uh, well, that's really all there is to it. It's a heap of op amps and some transistors, and there you go. This is just such a simple device. I mean, it's even more simple than an oscilloscope where you have to actually integrate the sweep generator into it, but this is just an XY display. All you need to do is uh, put a current through a couple of coils in relation to the input voltage. And you have to appreciate this, all this micro-looming they've got going on. There's really no need to loom that little piece of wire, but they've gilded the lily and they've gone for it. And the transistors around the back are just a really run-of-the-mill TIP35 and TIP36 pair uh, making up the vertical power amplifier. And the two giant 9500 microfarad caps make up the plus-minus 32 volt rail which powers the two transistors. Ah, who needs regulators? Just throw a few more MFDs in there! And since this is a quite specialised piece of equipment, of course the picture tubes held together with electrical tape. And they definitely haven't spared any expendable the switches. And the custom reticule comes on. Just like so. Very custom indeed. Analog TV vision. And the real colour of a phosphor. A cool blue with green traces. That's funky. And if you look closely you can see that someone's had a bit of an oopsie and forgot to turn the auto-blanking back on. Whoops. And here's a demonstration of a phase issue. When you feed uh, the same signal to both the horizontal and the vertical you're supposed to get a straight line like this. Which we're getting right now, but that's only because I'm feeding a signal that's uh, 35 degrees out of phase. Indeed if we go back to zero degrees out of phase, in phase, we get that, and that's absolutely useless. The issue is also present and identical with both the vertical channels, so I'm inclined to believe that it's actually supposed to be this way. Oh, but have a look at this. It seems we have had some modifications to the schematic. Someone's very intentionally gone around I marked out a few changes around here. And right here we've got a cap across a resistor. Which could indeed do have something to do with our face issue. Hmm. This unit has been used in a quite specialised production environment, uh, analog TV to be exact. So it's not impossible that they've specially modified it at all. In fact, I know that it's quite common for the previous owners of this thing to do such things to their gear. And uh, judging from how far they've gone to produce the custom silk screen for the display, we might be on to something. Let's get the cover off and see. Uh, more than anything, I'm suspicious of this cap. And uh, we've got it labelled between pin 7 of an op-amp, which I've found, and the base of this transistor here across a 5.6k resistor. 
This is the upper amp right here. Well, that's the transistor. This is the 5K6 resistor. And if we have a flip around the board, we've got a giant bodge cap right there. And I wonder if removing that thing is not going to fix the face issue. Fingers crossed. Alright, fingers crossed. We've got uh, a 500 hertz signal going into both the horizontal and the, neck and the vertical. So let's power on. Nope. Didn't fix it. And sadly, I'm not willing to troubleshoot too much beyond that because uh, it's a bit of a bother. There's no silk screen on this board, so treating everything out is a real major pain. However, I am going to give a shot at replacing these two rather crusty, cracky, leaky Sprague electrolytics. Oh, thank goodness for the manual because there's no sensible marking of these old caps whatsoever. But they are TE twelve elevens, which means a hundred mic, twenty five volts. So fingers crossed again. But new caps, no dice. No, even poking around with a capacitor at all the mod points I've been able to find and uh, replacing another resistor. The best I've managed to do is uh, increase the horizontal gain range by about an order of magnitude. But it's still pretty unlinear. This is at uh, just a hundred hertz horizontal sweep and it's just nowhere near as good as it should be. And with that, I'm just gonna leave you with some cool waveforms. Thank you for watching. Cheerio.